I'm Bill Butel for New York, New York. This past week saw the publication of two major books attacking right-wing extremism. This past week, full-page ads appeared in New York and Washington newspapers attacking right-wing extremism. This past week, Look Magazine's lead article was a long account of the work of extremists of the far right. And this past week, we took our cameras to a meeting of the John Birch Society, the most well-known of the large number of organizations that place themselves to the extreme far right of the political spectrum. Political extremism in America is not something new. In a country whose political tradition is essentially one of moderation, the dissident minority on either side of the center has been a welcome and often productive source of new and usable ideas. But not for many years has the issue of political extremism been given the attention it's getting in this presidential year. The extremists in this country are said to number as many as seven million. There may or may not be logic to the assertion that they were given new strength one night three months ago in San Francisco's Cow Palace. I would remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. The storm of criticism that followed led Senator Goldwater to make several clarifications. One day later, this paraphrase, extremism is no sin if you are engaged in the defense of freedom. One month later, he said, wholehearted devotion to liberty is unassailable. Later, he compared the extremism he was talking about to his love for his wife, for example, or to General Eisenhower leading his troops onto the beaches of Normandy. In any case, the John Birch Society says Senator Goldwater's acceptance speech heightened public interest in the organization, that there has been a noticeable pickup in recruitment ever since. A John Birch meeting begins with the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with, with liberty, liberty and, and justice, justice for all. And now we'll have a moment of silent prayer. We'll see more of this John Birch Society meeting later in our program. To these people in our studio today, both of them major leaders of the John Birch Society, a meeting like this is a gathering of dedicated, patriotic Americans getting together to face what they consider to be a clear and present danger, a communist takeover of the United States. But to these equally dedicated and patriotic Americans, the John Birch Society and other right-wing extremist groups represent an even more clear and present danger. One that Benjamin Epstein, national director of the Anti-Defamation League of Ney Brith, calls a danger on the right in a book just published by Random House. Co-author of the book is Arnold Forster, general counsel and national civil rights director of the Anti-Defamation League. Arthur Larson's concern in this same matter has been so great that he did more than write a book. He founded an organization. This former member of the Eisenhower administration got together two weeks ago with a group of equally distinguished citizens. They call themselves the National Council for Civic Responsibility. All of these people and our program today are concerned with this question. Is there a danger on the right? <laughs> Today on New York, New York, some answers to the question of a danger on the right. The first part of our program is concerned with the John Birch Society and one of its meetings we filmed only last week. 22 miles from Manhattan in the rolling hills north of the Watchung Mountains is Summit, New Jersey, a pleasant suburban community of middle and upper middle class homes. At 57 Drum Hill Road is the residence of Dr. Forster G. Rule, an obstetrician and a member of the John Birch Society which says it is nonpartisan. Only a few things set Dr. Rule's home apart from its neighbors. One of them is a banner that flies beneath his American flag bearing the motto of the Revolutionary War, don't tread on me. And another is the playroom in his basement. A sign on his front lawn points toward his cellar door, which leads in turn to a reading room of the John Birch Society, an American opinion library. Meetings of the society are held here and at the homes of other members. These crossed American flags frame a portrait of the John Birch Society's founder, Robert Welch. This retired Boston candy manufacturer set up the organization in 1958. Its patron saint is John Birch. Trained for the clergy, he was killed in 1945 by communist troops in China, where he was conducting a mission for the U.S. Army. 
Among the goals of the society which bears his name are to combat more effectively the evil forces which now threaten our country, our lives, and our civilization. Robert Welch set these goals himself. He also wrote a book, The Politician, which he says is not to be considered the doctrine of the society, and another one, The Blue Book, which he says should be. In them and in other writings, he has accused former President Eisenhower of treason, bumper stickers attacking the United Nations, socialism, and urging support of the police. Books attacking all recent administrations, including the present one, none dare call it treason, the United Nations, the fearful master, and the Council on Foreign Relations, the invisible government, and other books supporting Senator Goldwater. Also available at the American Opinion Library are posters attacking the Civil Rights Bill and others purporting to show Martin Luther King at a communist training school. The meeting begins. We will now open our meeting with a Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now we'll have a moment of silent prayer. George Calarico, a plant supervisor from Nutley. Loretta Galasso, a housewife from Staten Island. Jean Brozand teaches the second grade in Berkeley Heights. Host for the meeting is Dr. Rule. Policemen, white collar workers, professional men. The local chapter leader is a professor of economics at Wagner College on Staten Island. His name is Vincent Banus. Well, we have two guests with us tonight. I think you've all met them, but you know they're both officials of the John Burr Society. To my immediate left is uh, Ernie Grossang, uh, state coordinator, and uh, Tom Davis, uh, major coordinator of the Society for the Northeastern States. Nice to see everybody. To Ernie's extreme left, did you say? Uh, well, <laughs> we'll look past that one. Uh, now, uh, we have a few business preliminaries to get through. Maureen, have you collected the due? Yes, I have. Maybe I'll say accounted for. Mm-hmm. And uh, we all have our members' monthly messages. Yes. Yes. Now, again, if you'll excuse the, excuse the, impre uh, the expression, but if you're passing to your left. Thank you. Thank you. Now, this is, this is our meeting for the month of October 1964. And uh, this meeting will be devoted primarily to a review of the bulletin of the Society for the month of September. Uh, we will then, of course, subsequently review the uh, uh, current month's bulletin, the month of October. Uh, before getting into the specifics of the uh, program, I'd like to make some prefatory remarks which will uh, uh, tend to keep in perspective the discussion we're going to have on the uh, uh, specific projects that uh, are included in the agenda. First of all, the proud members of the John Best Society were all engaged along with the society in a, an epic undertaking. Our aims have been stated as less government, more individual responsibility under God, and a better world. Now, we all realize that before we can get to the major portions of this, this program, or these goals, we have got to defeat the international communist world control conspiracy. And that we will do. Now, in the course of this, um, we recognize that our major, uh, our major strategy will be education. And our major tool and only tool will be the truth. Our job is, first of all, to educate ourselves. And then after educating ourselves, to educate as many of our neighbors and uh, the people we come across in the, in the ordinary course of our social uh, and business lives. The, the discussion now will concern itself with our long-term projects, which are listed on this uh, easel over here. And we'll take them in the precise of the same order in which they appear there. The first one is recruiting. Now, as you all know, we seek to have associated with us uh, only men and women of sound character, good conscience, religious ideals, and fervent patriotism. Our goal is to secure one million such members. Uh, we're some distance from that, but we're making a fair, uh, we are making considerable progress. Uh, for example, during the month of August 1964, we broke all records with, res with respect to new members and new chapters. And it's my understanding that the month of, the, the month of September exceeded that. Uh, let's help in every way we possibly can to make sure that the month of October even exceeds September. Um, now, does anybody have any, any comments to make with respect to recruiting? Oh, yes. Why, I find that uh, the book by John Stormer, None Dare Call It Treason, is a tremendous help in recruiting. I, uh, I agree with you. It's been our experience that this is uh, a, um, a very, very interesting book. 
Nandi, I call a treason by John A. Stoner. It's an interesting story, and I guess most of you are probably familiar with it. It was published during February of 1964, and with practically no mention in any of the major media communications, whether it's newspapers, magazines, book reviews, television, radio. And practically being unavailable in the commercial bookstores, it has sold to date to approximately 6,800,000 copies and has gone through its 20th printing. Uh, I think it, it, it's reasonable to, to um, say that the members of the society have done a remarkable job in connection with the distribution of this uh, book. I might casually mention in, in passing that I do not know of a book other than the Bible that has a larger or more dedicated sales force. I think the members of the society have done a remarkable job in, in distributing this uh, book at Stromer's. Well, I guess we'll cover that, so let's come to the next one, uh, number two on our uh, permanent agenda, and that is the movement to impeach Earl Warren. The movement to impeach Earl Warren. Uh, you all know we've been working for quite some time on, on, the, on um, securing the impeachment of the Chief Justice, and there's a variety, a variety of reasons for this. First of all, we firmly believe that he has violated his oath of office to protect, defend, and uphold the Constitution of the United States and believe he has been doing quite the contrary. Uh, interesting little thing, we believe that, uh, while it may not, may not be germane at this point, that at the time he was appointed Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, he had very little judicial experience of note. And there's some open question as to whether at that time he knew the difference between um, a law book and a serious law about catalog. Um, but more and more important and more serious, uh, uh, serious import is the fact that the Chief Justice has, has been the leading advocate, <coughs> uh, setting the stage for the current uh, uh, series of racial riots that are now rendering this country apart. Uh, in addition, the general tenor of the, of the, of the um, Supreme Court decisions, particularly since 1954 or thereabouts, have tended to uh, destroy the republic that our forefathers set up for us and converted into a mobocracy. Um, now, we didn't say it, but the communists themselves have publicly declared that one batch of decisions by the Warren-led Supreme Court have constituted the greatest victory of the Communist Party in the United States. As I say, we didn't say that. The communists themselves did it, and I think this gives you some inkling as to what the, uh, the um, actual going on, going on had been in the court itself. Barton, uh, me, uh, is that particular comment you just made, is that in Rosalie Gordon's book, Nine Men Against America? Uh, we'll come to that, uh, Laurie. Uh, I, I want to mention in connection with that, if there any, any, I think we have one or two new members here. I want to mention the information we have available uh, in connection with this. Now, the other thing that uh, the court has done is to, is to uh, take steps to remove uh, the spiritual foundation of our republic. And I think, I think you all know it is now unconstitutional for children to recite prayers in our public school or to read from the Bible. These are strange times in which we live. Now, any, uh, the, the, the uh, tool, the principal tool we have in connection with the impeachment is all one, is a packet. Nine Men Against America and Auxiliary Material. This is by Rosalie Gordon. Uh, this completely documents the case uh, uh, for the impeachment of the Chief Justice. Uh, it's available in, in our own library, and of course it's available for distribution. And an interesting little thing is that uh, the retail value of this is $2.45, and it's available for $1. I think it's an, a wonderful economic bargain, among other things. Are there any comments now with respect to the um, uh, yes, impeachment? Yes, uh, Mr. Spencer, I have the chapter's uh, impeachment petition with me this evening, and uh, we have acquired 50 signatures this week around. Well, that's, that's fine. That's fine. This will help to... Um, help us to meet our goal of 10 million signatures to be, to, to be um, affixed to uh, petitions uh, for the uh, impeachment of Mr. Chief Justice Earl Warren. I'd like to say just one very minor thing, and that is this, that we, we, hold, no, uh, we, don't, we, do, we hold no personal animosity toward, uh, toward uh, Mr. Chief Justice Warren. As a matter of fact, we wish him well. But I think the worst thing in the world that could happen from our point of view is that any physical harm should be, should be for him. We need him desperately. So um, let's bear that in mind. No personal animosity. We uh, have in mind only that we'd like to see him impeached as a symbol of the uh, sense of the uh, forces that are uh, converting our uh, Constitution from what it was intended to be into a totally different kind of document. All right? Now, are there any further comments with respect to the, the movement to impeach Earl Warren? All right, with that, let's go to the third item. Um, third item. The United Nations, get us out. 
Now, again, this is another movement and a permanent project on our agenda that we've been working out for quite some time. Uh, we feel that the, the, uh, United, the United States should get out of the United Nations for a, a number of reasons. Principal among these, these is the recognition of the fact that the U United Nations was conceived by communists. It was organized by communists. It is controlled by communists. And it has been used and is being used to further communist objectives. Uh, we have available to us a uh, fine tool to bring to the American people the story of the United Nations. It's um, G. Edward Griffin's The Fearful Master. And incidentally, this book came out only a month or two ago. It has gone through a first printing, a second substantially larger printing, and is now in a third still larger printing, and we can't, uh, we can't uh, get them fast enough. Are there any comments with respect to the, um, the, um, the fight among the agenda? Well, this certainly is true. Uh, we are out of copies at the moment, and we've gone through at least 100 copies here at the uh, library. Certainly, we understand that uh, the public is very ignorant on the subject of the UN. And that this certainly is a very good tool, this, this uh, book by Ed Griffin, uh, <clears throat> in alerting people to the vagaries of the UN, how it runs, who runs it, and so forth. I think one of the one thing that everyone ought to know, uh, if they know nothing else, that the uh, one thing that the book brings out is that uh, there is one position which is very sensitive and very important about which very few people know, and this is the, so the title Under Secretary General of Political and Security Council Affairs in the UN, and this man is responsible for a number of things. One of these is for the, he's responsible for the control of the military and the police functions of the UN. He is responsible for the atomic energy entrusted to the UN. He's also responsible for all disarmament, which might be considered by all the member nations. Mm -hmm. And this particular post in the UN has been held ever since the inception of the UN in 1945 by a Russian communist. There have been eight people since 1945 who have held this position, and this has always been in the hands of a Russian or a communist, uh, I think one of them was a Yugoslav. Well, Dr. Rule, wasn't that, wasn't that uh, part and parcel of a secret agreement between Al uh, Alger Hiss and Molotov, that the, the person who occupied this position would always be a, uh, a Russian? This is true. I think they had a tacit agreement that uh, the position would always be held by a communist, by and a, by a uh, Russian uh, national. And wasn't Al Alger Hiss the first secretary general? The pardon? Was Alger Hiss the first sec secretary general of the United Nations? Yes. This is a further yes. indication of the, of the uh, background that people should be more aware of. Are there any further comments with respect to the United Nations? Yes. Craig Lee himself, in a recently written book, admitted that fact, did mm he -hmm. huh? uh, I understand, yes. Yes. I think this is the type of information we want to get across to the American people. All right, if there are no further comments with respect <coughs> to the um, um, United Nations, so let's go on to our next item on the agenda, number four, and that's the question of civil rights. Uh, let's understand to begin with that we're certainly for civil rights. There's no question about that, um, and we want to make that quite clear. Uh, I think it also should be said, of course, that the civil rights slogan and the so-called Negro revolutionary movement in this country are being used in precisely the same way and for the same purposes that the cry of agrarian reform was used in China some 20 years ago by Mao Zedong and the, and the people associated with him. It would appear that the, uh, that, uh, the, uh, the revolutionary Negro met revolutionary movement and so on is completely synthetic, and we believe that the only thing necessary to uh, have this resolved would be a sufficient understanding on the part of the American people of the communist hands behind this. I say, we say it's synthetic uh, to quote to ex-President Hoover. Uh, the American Negroes own more automobiles than all of the Negroes in, in Africa, plus all of the Russians in Russia. And in addition to that, another very interesting <laughs> fact developed by ex-President Hoover, the, uh, the, a larger percentage of Negroes have a college education than the percentage of English white people. Now, right, I think these are things to bear in mind in, in any discussion you get into with your neighbors, friends, and so on. <coughs> now, uh, of course, in connection with the civil rights, we do have, again, uh, tools available to us. We have the uh, so-called civil rights packet. Um, which includes a uh, book by, called Co Color, Communism and Common Sense by Manning Johnson. 
I think you all know that Manning Johnson was a Negro who uh, uh, ascended quite high in the ranks of the communist conspiracy and ultimately became aware of the fact that the Negroes were being used for, the, uh, for communist purposes. And after he became aware of this, he had the courage to lead the conspiracy and with tremendous personal sanctification, uh, devoted the rest of his life to um, undoing the damage that he had done while a member of the conspiracy. Uh, this is available all in, in, in the chapter library. It, of course, is also available from, um, from the American Penny Library and so on, and we highly encourage the, uh, the broad uh, distribution of this. Professor? Yes. Didn't Manning Johnson meet an accidental death under somewhat strange circumstances after he wrote his book? Yes, Bob, this has been characteristically true. It is not known that any Negro uh, who has ascended to any height in the conspiratorial arrangement of the communists and thereafter defected, lasted very long. They all come to, came to untimely and invariably uh, violent ends. I believe that uh, when Manning Johnson wrote, wrote his book and allowed it to be published, he knew that he was signing his own death certificate. As a consequence, I think we all owe his memory, uh, owe him uh, uh, a great deal. I believe he's a genuine patriot. All right, then item number uh, five on the permanent agenda is the Liberty Amendment. The Liberty Amendment. And to encapsulate this um, in short order, uh, there is nothing in the United States Constitution that permits or allows the federal government to, to participate in private venture, uh, in business ventures. It is a matter of fact that over a period of time, uh, the um, uh, federal government has uh, been gradually uh, has gradually built up a major uh, a major interest in business. It is now operating uh, through approximately 700 corporate entities, a vast empire of uh, enterprises, uh, which have an annual cost of approximately $50 billion, $50 billion a year. Now, none of these enterprises pay taxes, and none of them pay rent. And certainly, uh, we have no evidence that any of them produce any profit. And the, uh, the goal here is to uh, get the federal government out of business. Now, if you get them out of these businesses that cost $50 billion a year, it's painfully obvious, or delightfully obvious, whichever way you prefer to put it, that the government will no longer need the approximately $42 billion of, uh, of income it receives now from the graduated income tax. I'd like to say one further thing that is not generally known to the American public, and that is this, that the graduated income tax was actually conceived and recommended uh, by Karl Marx, alias Mordecai, in the um, Communist Manifesto in 1848 for the destruction of our country. If somebody came to me and said that they had a plan uh, through which I could stop paying my income taxes and yet not hurt or injure my government, I think my reaction would be, it sounds like a great idea, tell me more about mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Well, all right, then the basic idea is wherever, wherever you can and, and however you can, all within the, the area of legitimacy and so on, uh, support the Liberty Amendment people. All right? Now, do we have any further comments with respect to the Liberty Amendment? Yeah. All right, then we come to the sixth item in our permanent agenda, and that is support your local police. Support uh, your local police. Professor, may I interrupt you? Uh, yes, certainly, Jim. Uh, all of you uh, here, of course, know me. I am a policeman. I can speak with some authority on this. We don't feel we have support now, and it better be coming in a hurry. These, uh, the riots have stopped for the time being, and I certainly hope they don't, uh, uh, we don't see them again, but I'm just afraid we might very well, unless enough people take an interest in their community <coughs> and their policemen. Thank you, Jim. I think you're absolutely right there. You, re you realize we all know uh, from uh, recent experience that we've had the serious racial riots, not only in Hall, but in the Bedford Stuyvesant area, Rochester, Philadelphia, and so on. Um, we also know that uh, these riots were so spontaneous that it was decided to hold them off until after the election. And I think this is highly significant. <laughs> highly significant. Um, the police literally represent the last physical bulwark between the American people and the forces of evil and violence that, uh, are, uh, that uh, the communists are attempting to um, uh, start. And I think we had better bear this in mind. This is a deadly serious, uh, deadly serious thing. I think the other thing that's important to remember is that uh, we, have the, we have constant cries from the same sources of start the riots or participate in, in them about police brutality and about uh, civilian uh, review boards. I think it's particularly interesting to note that the uh, FBI recently made a report concerning its investigation of incitation to riots, riots, and among other things, they mentioned that the two cities, the only two cities in the United States with civilian police force, 
found themselves in a position where the police were practically paralyzed. This is vitally important. I think the society was among the first to recognize that, the, 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 that it was a major communist objective to paralyze and demoralize the police, fully recognizing that if they can do that, then they're free to, to uh, indulge in their normal pastimes of uh, murder, arson, rape, and, and, and. As I say, a deadly serious thing, we better pay attention to it. It makes it sound, Barney, that wherever police review boards have been introduced, it smells the smack of a policy of appeasement. And it puts me in mind of Hiram Mann's old reflection concerning appeasement when he had said that all men lose when freedom fails, for then the best men rot in stinking jails, and those that cry, appease, appease, are hanged by those that they try to please. Mm -hmm. uh, that's very appropriate. Uh, but I think it's very appropriate, and of course, it's your usual poetic touch to <laughs> and then you're back to Next in our program, Benjamin Epstein and Arnold Forster of the Anti-Defamation League and Dr. Arthur Larson of the Council for Civic Responsibility will be given a chance to comment on some of the statements that were made on that meeting of the John Birch Society. Let me begin by posing a question to Dr. Larson. Sir, may I ask you how serious you consider to be the rise of right-wing extremist groups? After seeing this film, I considered it a lot more serious than I even did before I saw it. Why do you say that, sir? Well, I have never had the privilege of seeing a John Birch Society meeting at first hand before. And if someone had told me, I uh, really couldn't have believed it. I feel as though I've come out of a totally different planet. I see things being stated as facts that bear no relationship to the facts at all. We, we set up this National Council for Civic Responsibility in order to expose extremism in positions, extremism in methods. But uh, if we had worked for years, we couldn't have produced a footage of film that would more eloquently show what the problem is and what the evil is that we're trying to combat. I'd like to uh, illustrate this by just taking one simple question of substantive fact and putting it to my colleagues here on the other side who represent the John Birch Society once and for all to see whether we can get at what is true and what is false. I'm not talking about opinion now. Some things in American political discussion are matters of opinion. Some people think democracy is the best form of government for us. Mr. Welch, the founder of the John Birch Society, thinks democracy is a fraud and has said so in print. That's a matter of opinion, I suppose. But now let's talk about a matter of fact. The United Nations, I jotted down, I never saw this film before this moment, I jotted down specific statements of fact about the United Nations that are not distortions, they are not half-truths. To call them half-truths is to give them 50% more credit for truth than they contain. They are complete untruths. It was stated in this open meeting that the United Nations was conceived by the communists. This is not true. The United Nations was conceived in 1943 at Dumbarton Oaks by an American committee appointed by Cordell Hull. It was said it was originated by communists. This is not true. It was originated in San Francisco in 1945 by a large group of about 50-some nations. It was said that it was used to further communist aims. Now, this is the most Alice in Wonderland through the looking glass, upside down, reverse of the truth that I have ever heard stated in a comparable setting. The fact of the matter is, and it can be documented by official records down to the ground, the Soviet Union, has never won, and the United States has never lost on any major issue involving its interests where they have been pitted on opposite sides of the question. I'll say that again. The Soviet Union has never won. The United States has never lost on any major issue in which the Soviet Union has tried to get something done in the United Nations or where their interests have been put, pitted against each other. Now, I don't ask you to take that necessarily just on my uh, say-so, but I have a research center, I think the largest research center in the world, at Duke University, dealing with United Nations affairs. We study every vote that's taken in the United Nations year after year. For example, in the 16th General Assembly, 
There were 62 resolutions. The United States abstained in four. As for the remaining 58, the United States was on the successful majority side in 55. That's 55 out of 58. That's typical, year after year. As for the 17th General Assembly, I won't give, go on with statistics for all these, but Senators Gore and Alec reported to the Senate Committee as follows. The United States maintained its record of never having lost a UN vote of vital importance to its national security interests. This is the official senatorial report on the way the United States is doing in the UN. Now, not only has the Soviet Union not won, it has been consistently condemned, censured, clobbered, defeated in vote after vote. The 50 megaton bomb vote, the Tibet vote, the Korea vote, the Hungary resolution, the resolution trying to condemn Hammarskjöld, the Cuba resolution trying to condemn us, the Cuba, uh, the Hong Kong refugee resolution, the, ref uh, the uh, expropriation resolution, the uh, Congo expenses and Middle East expenses resolution on which they were severely defeated, repeated votes on the ceding of communist China, the rejection of the Troika, the uh, vote on the United Nations bond issue, and all down the line, it's, it's almost monotonous. The Soviet Union gets defeated time after time. And how out of this anybody with this uh, record available as a simple matter of official record, how anybody comes to the conclusion that the, the uh, Soviet Union uses the United Nations to uh, further its interest is just, uh, just beyond the realm of a human rational mind to conceive. If now, I may turn for a moment, sir, without interrupting Dr. Larson, to Mr. Forster and Mr. Epstein. Now, you've heard uh, Dr. Larson's uh, criticism in terms of fact of uh, certain allegations of the uh, John Birch Society. You gentlemen wrote the book uh, together, Danger on the Right. Uh, what did you see uh, in the John Birch Society and related organizations, uh, similar organizations, that made you decide that uh, you should write this book? Why the need for this book? Is the John Birch Society or right-wing extremist groups uh, th that strong a force within our society today? Mr. Foster? Well, we've seen in the last year a proliferation of right-wing organizational life that begins to give it a serious evil impact on the American scene that justified the exposure that we are hoping a danger on the right gives to this phenomenon. But uh, I must... Uh, comment that I found it as difficult as Dr. Larson did to come back to the real world after the unrealism of 20 minutes of a John Birch Society meeting. He talked in depth about the lie they make of the United Nations. I noticed that uh, Mr. Bannis, who chaired the meeting, said that the major tool, indeed the only tool of the John Birch Society, is truth. And then I began to jot down as they talked some of their kinds of truths. You mentioned, I think, some of their truths is that President Eisenhower was a dedicated, conscious agent of the communist conspiracy. And that this Mr. is a, a quote from... Uh, from a, Mr. A, Welch, from Mr. who is the Not head of the John Birch Society. Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, during the course of the recitation here, we saw Martin Luther King juxtaposed with a communist school to give the clear and lying impression that Luther King is a communist. In so far as their spokesmen are concerned, I could analyze in depth the evil of comparing the Negro Revolution to which Dr. Bannis adhered to the agrarian reform movement in China, giving the impression that here and now the communists are using the race revolution as the commies did in China a long time ago. The simple fact is that the FBI just recently released a report in which they said, and I quote, the Communist Party does not appear to have instigated these riots. Now for me, the epitome of truth, their kind of truth, were two statements made by a member of the National Council, Dr. Revelo P. Oliver, just some weeks ago on the West Coast. And incidentally, he's a teacher at the Illinois. University of Illinois. He said, and it was reported in the press, that 10 days before President Kennedy was assassinated, the American government rehearsed his funeral. He said, too, that the CIA is nothing but an arm of the Russian secret police. 
But if there is any difference, it's a difference only in bookkeeping. These indeed are the kinds of truths that we've come to expect from the John Birch Society and the essential reason that we believe it's the evil that danger on the right tries to say it is. May I interject here for just a moment, apropos of uh, Mr. Uh, Professor Revelo's uh, uh, statement, I would guess that uh, some, somebody, uh, that the John Birch Society would reply that that was not official policy, the statement about the rehearsal for President Kennedy's uh, uh, funeral. Would this vitiate your objection? Well, I don't know what official policy is. When Ben Epstein or Arnold Foster stands up representing the Anti-Defamation League, what we say the agency is labeled with. If Mr. Oliver walks around the country and stands on extremist platforms and continues to be a member of the John Birch Society National Council, what he says must be attributed to the organization which he represents just as much as the remarks of Robert Welch must be charged to the John Birch Society so long as he continues as its head. Mr. Epstein, the whole question of danger on the right, uh, reactionary groups, uh, brings up the old statement that uh, we say it, it could never happen here. We always refer to the fascist takeover in Central Europe, in, in, in Germany. Uh, is this why you wrote this book? Do you think there is a danger of it happening here? Well, I do think it can happen here, and I couldn't help but feeling as I watched this film, of this meeting of the John Birch Society in New Jersey, that I might have been in Nazi Germany in 1934, where I sat in such meetings as a student at the University of Berlin and listened to the kinds of lies and half-truths and oversimplifications that were made in this meeting. The kind of an attack that was made on an illustrious jurist like Supreme Court Justice Warren is really hard to believe. To make the statement that Supreme Court Justice Warren doesn't know the difference between a law book and a Sears Roebuck catalog is shocking. Here was a man who has given 50 years of his life to public service. He graduated from law school in 1914. He was the district attorney of Alameda County for 14 years. He was the attorney general of the state for four years. He was the governor of the great state of California for 10 years, and he was appointed Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court in 1953 by President Eisenhower. And yet, this gentleman from Wagner College has the audacity to charge the Supreme Court Chief Justice with not knowing the difference between a law book and a Sears Roebuck catalog. This is the kind of distorted lie that we heard from Hitler or Stalin. The other remark that I thought was a classic example of the propagandist technique was when the same professor, and I put the professor in quotes because I don't consider him a scholar after what he said here today, when he said, Karl Marx alias Mordecai. What did he intend to do by using that phrase, alias Mordecai? What do you was think he, he implying that Karl Marx was a Jew? Well, Karl Marx's father was a Jew. And Karl Marx's father was converted and baptized just as Karl Marx was to Christianity. In the same way that Barry Goldwater's father was a Jew and was converted to Christianity. Would we refer to Barry Goldwater today as Nay Goldwasser? Is this the implication to bring out the Jewish aspect of Karl Marx's background, the way the Hitler government constantly referred to communist Jewish conspiracy? Ben, Ben, you know, in the ADL's search of communism down to its very beginnings, one of the things that we did was to examine Karl Marx's life from beginning to end. And as I recall it, the only place before that I heard the name Mordecai attached to Karl Marx was, the, was in Theodor Fritsch's book, A Handbook, on the Jewish question, which was published about 80 years ago in Germany, went into about 35 editions, was regarded as the Bible of all the anti-Semites, was one of the base documents on which Nazi uh, Nazism was built. And I have never seen this translated into English. I have never seen it in an encyclopedia. You can look at the Columbia Encyclopedia, the Britannica, you will find it nowhere. I just wonder, Ben what the source of Dr. Bannis's information is for the allegation Mordecai. And I would just interject here, lest there be any misunderstanding, 
uh, on the record, the uh, John Birch Society is not anti-Semitic. Only, I only say that so that our, we are our, our to audience is not... We are referring made by the gentleman who yes, led sir. the discussion. But Mr. Welch has said that uh, he is not an anti-Semite and uh, the John Birch Society will never be anti-Semitic so long as he is uh, at its leadership. I only put that in for the sake of the record. Dr. Larson, you had something you wanted to say there. I was uh, reminded as this discussion progressed of a very curious coincidence which is that when it comes to honest-to-goodness combating the spread of international communism, not liberalism at home under the name of communism, real communism around the world, it's curious how often the Birch Society and the communists turn out on the same side of major votes. Both the Birch Society and the communists were against the United Nations bond issue. Both of them condemned Hammarskjöld. Both of them are against foreign aid, one of our chief weapons against the spread of communism. Both are against the reciprocal trade program. Both are against NATO. Both are shoulder to shoulder on these practically all of the key elements of our foreign policy that have to do with stemming the tide of communism around the world. And the only way you can explain this is that the, uh, the real program, as some of the more candid statements of the Birch Society have admitted. The real program is aimed at Washington. It's aimed at people at home, your own government, your own neighbor. And I'm afraid in the process, far from, uh, far from combating international communism in the true sense that some of us have had to stand up against in official positions on the real firing line and know what it's about. Far from doing that, the Birch Society is undermining that effort. It's undermining it in many ways uh, by by destroying or by injuring and damaging the most important tools and the most important weapons that we have in this fight, foreign aid program, reciprocal trade, United Nations, and all the rest. Gentlemen, if I may ask this question, what, what do you think, notwithstanding your criticisms and your ra rather outspoken criticisms of the John Birch Society, what do you think is the attraction of this organization? Now, I only uh, understand that last year, in 1963, the John Birch Society brought in over $1 million. Uh, it does not appeal only to uh, ignorant people. Many of the people, most of the people that I've met of the John Birch Society are very intelligent, uh, productive members of, of our society. What is the attraction well, to these the people appeal, of the John Birch Society? Sir? Uh, Bill, if I may just start this off, I yeah. think the appeal is a perfectly uh, understandable one. The appeal, as we saw, was patriotic, religious, the flag, the prayer, uh, the welfare of the country, and I think these are aims and goals that all decent Americans are very much dedicated to. And I don't think it's the aims or the goals that we're so concerned about as the means which the John Birch Society wants to use to get their brand not of democracy. You heard the phrase mobocracy. You heard the denunciation through the phrase republic, this constant effort to deny the basic uh, for example, the attack on the whole civil rights program. They start by saying, uh, we're for civil rights, and then go on to charge the Negro Revolution with being the work of communists, without any comment or discussion about the need to try to correct the evils and the injustices and the discrimination against American Negroes. What I think is so dangerous about uh, the John Birch Society as one of the groups is that they seek to offer false answers to very serious problems. They try to oversimplify the problem and give an answer, a simple answer. It's all the fault of an international communist conspiracy here in America. Well, all of us are against communism, but we cannot look at the United States in 1964 and say that there is a huge communist conspiracy on the American scene. It just isn't so. I'm a lawyer, a practicing lawyer for years. And if you don't know the facts about the case against you, you don't make a very good lawyer. And when I listen to this array of misstatements of fact, I, I see why it's impossible for people in the Birch Society to do anything effective, even if they uh, honestly think they're fighting communism. For example, if they think that Alger Hiss was the first Secretary General of the United Nations, what are we going to make of something like this? This is absolutely false. The first Secretary General of the United Nations was Trig Lee of Norway. Alger Hiss was the Secretary General of the San Francisco Conference, but you might just as well say that the Secretary General of the first Constitutional Convention, whom I suppose nobody can remember, was the first President of the United States. Mm -hmm. Or they say that the Under Secretary of the United Nations for uh, Political and Social Security Affairs is in charge of the military operations. This just is false. 
The United Nations has had four or five major military operations, Korea, Lebanon, Middle East, Congo, and now Cyprus. There's never been a Russian anywhere near the military command of those things. They've been commanded by Americans, by, uh, by uh, Indians, by Canadians, by Norwegians, by Swedes, by Irish, by just about uh, anything, but, but, but never a Russian. And yet, year after year, we keep getting this, this canard, this lie about how the Russians have a permanent deal that was made that they should always control the military operations. Now, I don't think there's any excuse for this. If you say these people are educated and intelligent people, and they come to us from colleges and so forth. There is absolutely no excuse whatever for these misstatements of facts that can be read on any simple uh, manual about the United Nations. So let me offer another reason for why I think the John Birch Society and similar extremist organizations can attract Americans. There's a sense of frustration today deeply embedded in the American people an American community which has always been used to easy victories, which has not been used to the Cold War frustrations that we've been suffering. Along comes the John Birch Society and other extremist organizations, and as Ben indicates, they offer glib, easy answers for very complicated problems. They would resolve the Cuban situation very quickly with nuclear military power. They would resolve the problem of Vietnam the same way and of Red China the same way. Well, these aren't easy answers. They are glib, Bill. We'll be back with you, we hope, to discuss uh, the historical role of the right-wing extremists in our society today. Right now, however, we're going to join our other guests and give them an equal chance to present the point of view of the John Birch Society. Colonel Lawrence E. Bunker was Colonel MacArthur's aide during the Korean War and also during, with General MacArthur's aide, I should say, during the Korean War and during the Japanese occupation. He's a member of the John Birch Society's National Council, as well as a member of his Executives Committee. He was uh, present at the Society's founding back in 1958 in Indianapolis. You all met Tom Davis earlier at the meeting in Summit, New Jersey. Mr. Davis is the John Birch Society's major coordinator for the Northeast area. Well, gentlemen, you've heard the criticism of your organization. Colonel Bunker, I'd like to turn to you uh, and ask for a brief uh, rebuttal of the statements that our, uh, the other uh, guests uh, on this program presented a few moments ago, as you care to, sir. Well, actually, as you know, there isn't time to rebut all the yeah. points that they have taken up. Mm -hmm. But I would like to establish one position, as far as I'm concerned, uh, in general principle, and that is that it has always surprised me that people of the intelligence of the gentleman here tonight and many others in this country would classify the basic policy of the John Birch Society as being extremist because the announced goals of our organization are for less government, more individual responsibility, and a better world. Mm -hmm. Now, what there is that is extreme about those, I am at a loss to understand. Mm -hmm. Also, when it comes to political philosophy, the, in my studies of political philosophy, the two extremes in government are anarchy, where you have no government at all, and complete dictatorship, whether by an individual or by a state organization. And those are the two extremes of political philosophy as far as the government is concerned. Now, the John Birch Society is solidly behind the American Constitution and is constantly saying so, that we believe that the founding fathers had a brilliant idea. It was the most advanced uh, form of government that has ever been devised by man. And we feel that it had everything to recommend it and that it was not an extreme form of government, that it went down the middle, that it wasn't the extreme even of democracy, which allows the majority to control everything. But it provided, the, as any republic would, the protection of minorities within the group. Now when you come to the actual practice of politics, you have again extremes. You have the extreme of the individual who sits on his hands and says, I'm going to do nothing about government. And you have the other extreme of the man who says, I'm going to take a gun and I'm going to get out and go out and get rid of the people who represent a different point of view. Now, those are the extremes of political action. And there again, the John Birch Society is in the middle. It doesn't associate itself with either extreme. We condemn people like uh, the Minutemen and the American Nazi Party, who do believe in violence. But we also condemn the people who would sit back and do nothing and not even be a good citizen. Mm -hmm. So that uh, on, those, on those issues particularly... Which do you condemn more? If I may ask. Well, it's very hard to decide sometimes. It depends upon which one has more influence at the moment. Mm -hmm. 
Mr. But, Davis and Colonel Bunker, I wonder if I may ask you a question. Uh, critics of the John Birch Society say that those people who join the John Birch Society are uh, misfits in our society. They say, uh, they, they use uh, more polite words, but essentially that's what they mean. They're malcontents, discontents with the, the order of things as they are. Colonel Bunker, may I ask you, sir, why did you join the John Birch Society? Well, I became interested in it when Bob Welch organized it, but I had been interested in these questions for a long time, ever since my college days and during the period of time when I acted as confidential secretary and then as legal associate to John W. Davis, who was the leader of the Jeffersonian Democrats, the discredited and disinherited branch of the Democratic Party. And, uh, of course, I became even more interested in some of these things when I was in Tokyo with General MacArthur and could see what was being done by the communist conspiracy out there and back in this country. Because sometimes distance lends a better perspective of what's going on. So that when Bob Welch uh, said that he was going to start this, and uh, for whatever reason, I've never been quite sure, invited me to go to that initial meeting in Indianapolis, I was very much impressed to find myself associating with people who were outstanding members of the community, like Bill Grady, who's the head of a large industrial firm in Milwaukee and had brought the J.I. Case Company back into satisfactory financial condition at one point. T. Coleman Andrews, who had been the Director the Commissioner of Internal Revenue, and uh, Dean Clarence Mannion, who had been the Dean of the Notre Dame Law School, and a number of other people of that caliber. I was, I am still impressed by the caliber of those men and their ability to analyze situations and their feelings on this particular subject. And I have always felt uh, not only honored, but somewhat flattered to be included in this group. Mr. Davis, do you seriously and honestly share the deep conviction with Mr. Welch that there is a communist conspiracy within the borders of this country uh, whose goal it is to take over the control of this uh, country? Yes, I certainly do, Bill. I think it's part of an international conspiracy. I think it exists in this country as well as around the world. Mm -hmm. We have seen for many years the physical evidences of it all over the world. And I think uh, those of us who have taken the time to uh, look into this and study it and see the evidences of it here. Briefly, uh, can you give me specific examples of this evidence? Oh, I think we can find them in, uh, in almost any phase of our national life and our national activity. I think we'll find it in government. I think we'll find it in politics. I think we'll find it, unfortunately, in religion. I think we'll find it in uh, labor and in business in education and so forth. How does this uh, evidence manifest itself? Well? well, in many different ways, and it's not always wide open, and, and uh, communists do not, as I'm sure you know, uh, come out into uh, any segment of our society or any society and simply announce that we are communists, here we are, we are, are here to destroy your education system or your uh, religious concepts. They go about their work in devious means and, and through devious methods. Uh, the activity of known communists in this country over the years is rather extensive. Uh, numerous uh, volumes have been written on it, the uh, committees of Congress, the Senate Internal Security Subcommittee, uh, the House Committee on American Activities, Mr. Hoover of the FBI, many other authorities of, of equal repute have reported to the Congress, have reported to the government, uh, who in turn have reported to the American people that uh, we have had this internal problem for many, many years. And again, uh, it is not a simple thing and an easy thing for an amateur or a layman to go out and hunt communists, and that is not the job or, or the business of the John Birch Society. That is the business of, of our government, and that's why one of the functions of our government. Nevertheless, we on the local level as individual citizens have been encouraged time and time again by uh, our officials in government to uh, be on the lookout and on the alert for those forces of subversion that will rise up amongst us, and, and we don't care whether that subversion comes in the form of socialism or Nazism or communism or collectivism. We think these are alien to our American way of life. I may interrupt again, sir. We are running short of time on the equal time provision here. Let me ask both of you gentlemen this. Do you consider that our society, your, your critics of our society as it now is established, I think, I, I think we, everybody accepts that, correct? No, I, do, I, do, I wouldn't agree with that, Bill. We are simply critical of the way it is working, it being made to work in certain fields, well, which we consider departure from the fundamental basis. All right, sir. Uh, uh, assuming, assuming that more limited uh, definition of your protest, uh, is this society as it is now structured and operating unable, in your point, from your point of view, to, to survive and cope with the challenges that we face? And if so, why? 
Well, I don't know what you mean by well, divide, I mean, because must, actually must we, it, must it we have been change. growing in membership ever since the society was no, organized, I don't, I don't so mean, apparently uh, we are. Excuse me, you, yeah, national, we misunderstand. <laughs> I don't society. mean the John Birch Society, I mean the society of which we are all a member. Is it, uh, uh, is our society, the American society, unable, and it's under its pre present structure, to cope with the challenges that we face now? And no, if because, so, why? No, because we, uh, we advocate doing nothing except through constitutional channels. We don't advocate, advocate any revolutionary activity. Mm -hmm. such as the Nazi party does. Mm -hmm. And uh, we believe that the uh, structure is there, the opportunity is there. That's one reason for the program to impeach Earl Warren, because the impeachment of a justice of the Supreme Court is the only way in which the American people can take action against the man they consider unsuitable for the job that he holds on the bench. What aspects of our society would you change? Well, I, I don't think that the, the, uh, the John Birch Society, of course, isn't in a position to do that in the first place, and it isn't our responsibility in the second place. Uh, Mr. Welch has repeatedly stated publicly that he believes that the American form of government is the finest form of government yet devised by man. He has repeatedly and publicly stated that he thinks 98 or 99 percent of the employees of that government are dedicated, loyal, and patriotic citizens who are trying to do their job to the best of their ability and in a patriotic way, what he is concerned about, what I am concerned about, what the members of the John Birch Society are concerned about, Bill, is that remaining 1% or one half of 1% or whatever it may be that is there to attempt, as they have throughout history and, uh, and other countries around the world, to come in and subvert the way of life which we do hold dear and cherish, and to try to do what we can is through an educational process to alert our not fellow Americans. Process. Absolutely not. Through an educational process to alert our fellow Americans to these dangers, to make our individual uh, fellow citizens responsible citizens and concerned about these things and not always and forever spending all of our time on uh, non-important aspects of our life. Gentlemen, I wish we could talk longer, but uh, we have under our previous agreement uh, given approximately equal time to both the members of the John Birch Society and our other guests who are not members of the John Birch Society. In the remaining few minutes in our program, we'd like to discuss one other aspect of the general subject of right-wing extremism. By prior agreement with the members of the John Birch Society who've been, who are with us today, we will not discuss the John Birch Society in these few moments. But I'd like to turn to Dr. Larson, if I may. At the beginning of our program, it was pointed out that uh, dissident minorities have always had a welcome and sometimes effective role in our society. In terms of the history of the American society, what is the role of the right-wing extremist group today? Does it have a role of value and benefit? No, I don't think so. I think this is quite a different affair. Um, and I don't see any benefit from it at all, quite a lot of harm, in fact. Because, as I said at the outset, a wide range of opinion we're used to in this country. But outright distortions and misstatements of fact. Thank you very much, gentlemen, on both sides of this political fence. Our purpose on this program has been to ask the question, is there a danger on the right? We've asked that question. We've gotten some answers to it. You will have to give your own answer. I'm Bill Butel reporting for New York, New York. Department of News and Public Affairs. This is Dick Mason. <laughs>